this is a panel, I believe, on religion, utopia, and violence. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things I have to make an announcement about. You might be wondering why there's only two of us. Well, uh, I got an email from uh, one of the organizers of this conference, and I was told that Jeff Ewing, who was going to present on Can There Be a Continued Critique of Earth Without Critique of Heaven, a reevaluation of the Marxian Critique of Religion. He can't make it because of family issues. And then uh, I got another email from uh, Jed Murr, who's a graduate student at the University of Washington. And he was on the fence about whether or not he could come because he had an oral exam coming up on Monday. And finally, I got an email from him yesterday or day, uh, two days ago telling me that uh, he cannot make it. So it's only the two of us. You just placed part of priorities. I know, absolutely. absolutely. Absolutely, why miss this? So uh, there's only two of us. And uh, we'll use this time extensively and luxuriously. And you can uh, ask us any question at any particular moment. But uh, before we do that, uh, basically the format is I'll let, uh, this is uh, Jason Kosnowski, University of Michigan at Flint, he's a system professor there. And he'll be presenting on Spectre and Spirit, Ernest, Ernest Bloch and Jack Derrida in the work of Marxist Utopia. And uh, uh, Jason, you told me that uh, you were working actively with a worker center in Michigan. And uh, he's also worked in different places from New York to San Francisco, East Coast, West Coast, a very cosmopolitan guy. And uh, <coughs> um, I might switch languages. In, in yeah, language. that's French, French German. Yeah. This is a cosmopolitan presentation. So if I speak, start speaking Italian, <laughs> you'll know why. Um, but the format is basically, basically uh, Jason will speak up to however long you like, and we'll break into Q&A, discuss, and then I'll go into my presentation about uh, Oscar Wilde and uh, his essay on soul of man and socialism. So uh, please, uh, Jason. Sure, thank right. you, thank you. Thanks for coming. And um, before I get started with my paper, I wanted to, I mean, since we have so much time, I thought that I would speak briefly about sort of its genesis. And it comes from actually my own teaching. And in my introduction to political theory, I teach political theory class, I have students read Marx. I, you know, it's kind of some of the best of. I have them read the manifesto. I have them read um, snippets from German ideology, from Capital from the Civil War in France and the 18th Brumaire. And then what I like to do is I like to, since an introductory class, I like to juxtapose Marx and, and all the other you know, dead white guys who I have them read with something contemporary. And what I have um, juxtaposed against Marx is a science fiction novel, a novel called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. I don't know if you've read it. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty funny. And it's sort of a, a, a near future, you know, it happens maybe 20 or so, 20 or 30 years in the future. And, you know, it was written in the mid-80s, though, so it might be happening <laughs> very, very soon. Um, dystopian novel about um, how, about a world where everything is commodified, everything is fractured, everything um, has uh, undergone time-space compression, as Frederick Jameson characterizes in, in his Marxist postmodernism. And um, I just basically want to get them thinking about what the future might be and how to think about the future um, in a concrete and effective manner. Now, the last time I, teach, I taught it, though, the students were very, very resistant. Not necessarily to Marx. I mean, hell, it's Flint, Michigan. You can see the detritus of <laughs> capitalism all around, uh, abandoned houses, empty factories. Um, but they were very, very resistant to the fact that I had them read a science fiction novel. That the future was something that they could even effectively think, think about. There was one student in particular, one of the smartest students in my class, who said, um, Jason, why are you having us read this? You know, and I said, exactly what I said. He said, and then he replied saying, well, but why should we, we can't really know what's going to happen in the future. This is a useless exercise. The future is something that is indeterminate. It will happen, and A, there's nothing we can do about it, and B, even if we could have some conception of what was happening 
there's no way that history would, you know, had any logic to it, had any, there was no connection between what happened today and what happened tomorrow. And that was quite a, quite a shock to me, especially when everybody else in the class said, yeah. You know, and he was sort of a leading student. So I, I started, I wanted to think about really, well, how can students start thinking about, and people start thinking about the future and start thinking about a, uh, not just a, a better future, but you know, possibly the end state of, of what we want, a future which is tied in with goals and values, and which is basically what I think utopia is. And um, so that's what brought me to these two thinkers, because even though I, at various points in his career, Bloch talks about his project in terms of hope, in various times he talks about utopia, and Derrida, who consciously eschews the term, Utopia, but he still has this not only orientation to the future, but an orientation to a, a better future, a value laden future, an end state, at least in terms of values, not sort of a concrete plan, a roadmap like Thomas More um, in uh, his famous Utopia might put out. So that's, that's where I come from, and that's what uh, inspired me to think about this. And an another very interesting thing. Another very interesting um, congruence between sort of the problem of my students, because you know if you teach at a teach if you're teaching a teaching institution, you think about you know your students quite a bit. Was and what drew me to these thinkers was both of them ground their thinking about utopia in the everyday, and I thought this was very very important, especially in terms of a Marxist view of utopia, because probably as many of us know, Marx and Engels were very, very critical of those who he called utopian socialists, and how there was no connection to any materiality, how there was no connection between these thinkers and any sort of trends within history, that they were you know, merely building castles in the sky, and if there wasn't any sort of connection with any sort of materiality, any sort of base, then the exercise was not only useless, but it was ideological. It would um, enc encourage people to sort of turn in upon themselves and not do the work that was necessary to bring about social change. Now, Bloch begins, uh, consciously begins in thinking about utopia with the everyday. Not with necessarily the everyday in terms of what a classical Marxists Marxist might think of work, the division of labor. He begins with the, very, the most mundane activities, fulfilling hunger, walking to the store, um, even you know, seeing a cloud. And he will say that within each of these experiences and with, within each um, concrete everyday action, there is what he calls an undetermined not yet and he'll use this phrase over and over again, within seemingly mundane, habitual, and determined experiences. And these um, experiences of the not yet, which we, ex which we perceive upon the fringes of our consciousness, lead us to um, formulate what he calls, and once again, he has many neologis neologisms, many excellent turn, turns of phrase, I think, little daydreams. And for example, if we are you know, going to the store, if we are going into the cupboard to um, get something to eat, to fulfill our hunger, that brings up a daydream of you know, possibly what it would be like you know, to live in a world with no hunger. What it, would it be like to live in a world of abundance of food? What it, would it be like if we could determine you know, what our meals were, as opposed to um, going to the store and just having, uh, uh, just being presented with a, uh, a counter of food which we don't produce ourselves, which we don't really um, have any process, we don't have any participation in creating. And this not, the, this not yet and its production and its transformation into little daydreams is, um, is uh, I don't want to say endemic, but it is a it is a prevalent and quite frequent occurrence. Now, um, these little daydreams, according to Bloch, um, 
are not sufficient unto themselves to create a what he will call an effective utopia or what he thinks is the real Marxist core of utopia. It, um, that would seem to fall into the trap of the utopian socialists. You know, they experience something, they dream it, and that turns into a goal or an end state. He is very, very clear that these little daydreams and the larger utopian thoughts that they, um, that they uh, inspire need to be mediated, need to be mediated with the concrete circumstances that are around them. That if we think of a, the utopian potential in a daily act that we, in order to get um, what he will call a really possible utopia, or what I, um, the more frequent term that he uses is the mediated novum. The new that is mediated with um, a concrete materiality. Um, we need to take and do a reflexive movement back with our utopian image upon the concrete possible um, material uh, structure in which we find ourselves. And in his, in his uh, longest work, um, The Principle of Hope, he will go through, and, and if you've ever looked at this book, it's, it's three volumes, and it, it begins with, a, it begins with a, a, not a short, but comparatively to the rest of the work, an introduction of 200 pages, and then for the next thousand pages, <laughs> literally, he will go on and say, you know, here's what I think are the um, really existing possi utopian possibilities in pretty much every area of human endeavor. Art, food, architecture, music, even film. Um, he, and he, it's a very, very exhaustive list. Um, and he will go through this process over and over again. You know, here's the, the, uh, the inspirational structure within uh, our daily lives. Here's the daydream. Here's the utopian um, surplus, he will call it, within the daydream. And then he will go back and, um, and then he will go back and mediate his image with what he sees to be the concrete material um, possibilities. Now, the thing is, within this process, he acknowledges that there will be many fits and starts. There will be many suppositions of what a, uh, a mediated novum will be, which will turn out um, to be not fruitful, not productive. Here, let me, um, let me uh, read a quote, a brief quote. Even if this brighter side also displays strong, even this brighter side strongly displays negative aspects, those of substitution, overblownness, abstraction, which were um, jointed in the 19th century by the mendacity of the ideal. Um, they are certainly not connected with the dark or sinister elements of the formation of the ideal. And so this process of mediation, he stresses, is a reiterated process. That utopia must come through a repeated process of mediation. And even if we think that we have created a utopia and a utopian image, which is falls in line with the material possibilities, which has been thoroughly mediated, he still says that with the possibility of fulfillment of utopia, there will be an accompanied, and he uses these two phrases over and over again, melancholy or pathos, that all utopias are partial. And it seems, this might seem like a contradiction, but Bloch, Bloch, Bloch insists on this, that this process of mediating our little daydreams, of, 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 of creating a possible utopia will always be accompanied by melancholy and pathos. Then again, what's, then you could say, well, what's the point? We've gone through, and especially after you've read Principle of Hope, we've, I've gone through 1,400 pages of this book. He's given me an exhaustive list of possible utopian uh, images, possible utopian paths to take in our current culture. But at the end, we still will have that the uh, an, an incompleteness. Well, what I find interesting is that not only in the inter introductory sections, the theoretical sections of this work, and this my paper, I should have said, focuses primarily on this work, um, uh, uh, the principle of hope, but also in 
the conc more concrete sections, he uses this term, the front, over and over again, the utopian front, that he's, that after creating utopian images, we gain not so much concrete images, concrete plans, you know, um, possibilities for action, but we gain an orientation towards the future, towards the progressive future. And he calls this the front. And it's very, very it, it, the front, you know, it, it, this is a, a term which implies, you know, definitely a uh, in, indeterminate utopian attitude, but, def <coughs> but definitely moving forward. And the, in the process of going through this long process, um, he also, went in, in, um, in noting the importance of the front, he notes that this will be work. And this is what I find most interesting, that building the front, that gaining an orientation towards the front will be work. And he uses phrases like the blissful work of explication, the blissful work of explication. He'll go on to say that um, all previous materialism, that's materialism that doesn't have this utopian aspect, lacks the constantly oscillating subject-object relation called work. And for me, this is really what the core of Bloch's thought is, in, um, not only when he was writing it, but for us today. Because, you know, if the process of utopia is a process, of constant creation, constant realization of imperfection, and we get this orientation towards the front, and we have to work towards it, then once again, what Bloch is presenting is an, is, is an indeterminate understanding of what the possibility and potentiality of utopia is, but he also adds not only a concrete aspect, but what I see to be a consciously Marxist aspect. Because when he goes through and talks about work, the type of work that goes into this process is um, a process that mirrors closely to the snippets, to the uh, fragments within Marx himself of what unalienated labor will look like. This process, this oscillating process, it's a dialectical process where we go from daydreams to the material. This process is a process that involves both the particular and the universal. We start with something within our daily lives and then we project into a more universal future, not only in terms of time and place. And finally, what I find most intriguing about this concept of work, this concept of utopian work, is that it is uh, a process of work that involves um, different understandings and different concrete actualities of work. It is an understanding of work that goes beyond the singular reified um, type of work that we experience within the division of labor. That it's a multiple type of work. And what is interesting and what I think is most uh, fruitful in thinking about Block today is trying to um, see how creating utopias is not about any sort of plan, any sort of um, map to the future, but it's about gaining this orientation towards the front through a process which really gives us an understanding and, and a quasi-experience of una unalienated labor. So, let me then turn to Derrida because, and I think we need to turn to some someone else, because even after this understanding of what utopia is, and not in the particularities of utopia, but in the process of creating utopia, many have criticized Bloch for still having a, a understanding of utopia that is mired in determinism, that is mired in uh, speculation, and uh, Darren Webb, who wrote a great book on, on Marxism in Utopia States, um, whilst uh, hidden beneath a bewilderingly complex set of categories, Bloch's method for distinguishing the concrete from the abstract and reaction are boiled down to nothing more than distinguishing between his own personal likes and dislikes. That, in fact, even po Webb 
will go on to say that even positing utopia and saying that there is a understanding of utopian labor grounded in a Marxist anthropology, which has been criticized on many fronts, as probably we all know, um, that just positing um, some sort of end state actually saps the revolutionary creativity and the possibilities for praxis of, a, of a collective social movement, a collective social movement that would need to be the basis of a revolutionary party that would bring about a revolution. So in um, trying to take those criticisms serious, criticism seriously, I've, I turn to Derrida, who I don't know if, if people have read Specters of Marx in this room, but you know the, the only uh, web refers to the bewilderingly complex set of categories in block. I, I sometimes I kind of I want to think, you know, why did I do this to myself? Because the only person who could put forth a more complex and more bewildering set of categories would be Jacques Derrida, <laughs> I think. Um, but you know, in this in this book, Inspectors of Marx, um, there are, are are some some fascinating and I think thought provoking similarities, and I think that reading them together is what. Um, can bring us to, to a better understanding. So in, in this work, Inspectors and Mark, Derrida begins by trying to affiliate himself with the type of Marxist critique. And he goes through, especially the German ideology and Marx's quotations of Shakespeare and his own understanding of um, the ghosts that haunt Hamlet and trying to transfer that into the ghosts, the specter that haunts um, the categories of bourgeois economics, such as money, value, price. Um, he, what he tries to do is he tries to articulate a similarity in the process of critique of deconstruction and Marxist ideology critique. And he, what he wants to say is that just as Marx says that these concepts of bourgeois um, economics obscure the reality beneath his deconstructive technique, what it does is it shows the exclusions of the assigning of, of meaning of these categories. But he will even go, Derrida will even go farther than Marx in that he will claim that any time we assign meaning to the complex, constantly shifting, internally contradictory thing that might be quote unquote, and I, draw strong quotes when I say this reality, because I don't know if they would use that word, but in trying to assign meaning, there's always a remainder. There are always sutured contradictions that come together. And even within Marx's categories um, that he thinks will overcome the uh, partial categories of bourgeois economics. He will go through and talk about the um, imperfections and the uh, remainders and the others of <coughs> concepts such as the proletariat, concepts such as unalienated labor. That every time, and this is, as, um, as you probably know, within the structure of meaning itself, every time we try to close and assign meaning, there will be these um, exclusions. So, I mean, at the end of uh, th this first round of trying to understand what Derrida is talking about, in terms of Marx, you could say, well, why does he even say that there's anything left of Marx? If even Marx's categories are um, subject to a deconstructive c critique, then why, you know, why, why is his understanding better than anybody else's? What Derrida will say is that in this process of constant critique, deconstruction, identifying of the others of the attempts to assign meaning. There is um, an understanding and affiliation experience. It's kind of hard to know exactly how to assign or how to characterize this. Because all meaning is, all meaning is partial, because all meaning is rife with contradictions, internal tensions, that there's, Derrida will say, this always present promise of deconstruction, of, de of critique, um, constitutes an opening, what he will call a messianic 
opportunity for change always to appear, always to um, be brought about. And it's a constant, what's, what's interesting is about, about Derrida, I think, is that it's a, um, he goes back and forth between thinking about deconstruction as something which sort of punches itself through, internal contradictions um, manifesting themselves, versus internal contradictions being brought about, brought about through a conscious act of critique of deconstruction. And, and I, I don't want to say what he privileges at this point, but the messianic, the always constant possibility for deconstruction, for breaking apart categories, for undermining the structures of power and the structures of meaning that undergird the structures of power, that to him is the affiliation. That to him is what um, ties him to Marxism. The, the, the messianic, the specter. A specter is haunting Europe, Marx says. Well, to Derrida, a specter is haunting meaning, and a specter is haunting all concepts, and that is a good thing. Because no matter how um, hopeless, no, ma no matter how seemingly caught within the confines of ideology, there is always this possibility to break apart even the most seeming to seemingly totalizing system. Let me read a brief quote from Derrida. Now, if there is a spirit of Marxism which I will never be ready to renounce, it is not only the critical Marxism which I will never be ready to renounce. Um, it is the, the critical idea of, or the questioning stance. It is even more a certain emancipatory and messianic aff affirmation, a certain experience of the promise that one can try to liberate from any dogmatics and even from any metaphysical religious determination from any messianism. And that, to him, is the promise. And this is the promise not only of, and what's important to me, and once again, even though Derrida would, would never say that he presents any sort of utopia, but for me, this is um, utopian in its orientation because it's not simply critique, but it's a promise of moving forward. It's the type of concept that Bloch puts forth in his understanding of the front. But once again, the messianic to Derrida, just like the front to Bloch, needs to be needs to be accompanied by a certain type of what I would call work. All throughout Spectres of Marx, uh, Derrida says that um, this messianic attitude, this breaking apart, needs to come through types of conscious action. For example, he's very, very emphatic and very, very clear that the um, others of meaning, the, um, those who are excluded from any attempt to uh, put up some sort of boundary, these others need to be uh, embraced by those who would want to bring about the messianic. They must, he, he uses the term Unheimlich the, in a, what I think is a consciously Freudian move to, um, to uh, stress that those who would wish to cultivate this attitude of the messianic need to um, be, uh, to be comfortable with and really embrace the uncanny. And the uncanny really the um, being at home and not home at the same time. Embracing what is other and trying to bring that back in to one's house, whether that be you know material house or house of meaning. And furthermore, once the Unheimlich is um, embraced, he calls, and this, this is what I find most fascinating with Derrida, he calls for the work of mourning, that the Unheimlich and the realization of the, um, the constantly excluded of others needs to involve a type of work that it's that um, in order to bring about the messianic what one needs to do is not simply move ahead to action not simply valorize the other in terms of changing one's own views in terms of making a new um, or idealizing a new social formation but to actually mourn to embrace what one has done in the past and 
to see what is produced from this morning. And here, let me read another quote. Because after embracing the Unheimlich and after the work of mourning, he states that, but as paradoxical as it seems, it is in this unleashed overflowing at the moment when all joints give way between form and content that the latter will be, proper, will be properly its own and properly revolutionary. By all logic, one ought to recognize it by nothing other than the excess of this timely disidentification. And this disidentification comes out through Unheimlich and through mourning. Therefore, nothing that is. As soon as one identifies a revolution, it begins to imitate, it enters into a death agony. So through this work of mourning, he hypothesizes that truly new paths of action, truly new possible affiliations, and truly new and disidentified understandings of what the future might be will come about. And, and uh, obviously, when it, this uh, stress on work um, is at least superficially similar to the type of work that I talked about in terms of blah. But at the end of the day, many people have criticized Derrida for the exact opposite thing that I brought out in terms of criticisms of blah. Um, in, especially in the uh, volume Ghostly Demarcations, a symposium on Jacques Derrida's spectrum of mark. Theorist after theorist will come out and say, basically, Derrida, you have given us nothing. You've given us the vaguest of the vague. And that probably no one's as stinging as Terry Eagleton is when he states, uh, Derrida has now taken Marxism on board, or at least dragged it halfway up the gangplank because he is <laughs> properly enraged by liberal capitalist complacency. But is, there is also something unavoidably opportunist about this political pact, which wants to exploit Marxism as critique, dissent, a conveniently belaboring instrument, but is far less willing to engage with its positivity. So at the end of the day, we have Bloch's positive, still vague, yet still positive in the sense of bringing about plans and sort of concrete visions of what utopia might be. And Derrida's seemingly very negative, deconstructive understanding in the, me in the messianic of what um, utopia might be. I don't want to go into it, but, okay. but I'll, I'll try to wrap it up because what's interesting about um, these two is when we bring them together, I think, especially on this concept of work, we get not only a stronger concept in terms of utopia in general, but we get a stronger concept in terms of Marxism. And let me go into briefly um, what my thoughts are on this, because especially recently, um, there have been a number of people who have been trying to re-engage with the concept of utopia, um, especially um, people who have been working in the Marxist tradition, such as Frederick Jameson, and I don't know if you've seen his book, Archaeologies of the Future. Um, there's a very fascinating quote in this, where he says, that in postmodernity, and this is his understanding of postmodernity, not a completely groundless postmodernity, but an especially obscure, fragmented, time, space, compression, rife, um, uh, uh, capitalism characterized by flexible accumulation, that what is important about utopias is valorizing the um, plurality of possible utopias. Let me read a quote from James from Archaeologies. Um, Wish fulfillments are, after all, by definition, never really fulfillments of desire, and must presumably always be marked by the hollowness of absence or the failure at the heart of the most dearly fantasized vision, a point Ernst Bloch never tired of, tired of making. Even the process of wish fulfillment includes a kind of reality principle of its own, intent on not making things too easy for itself, accumulating the objections and the reality problems that stand in its way so as the more triumphantly and realistically to overcome them. Let me go on and read another quote. And this quote stresses not just the importance of, uh, uh, of incomplete utopias today, but the plurality of utopias. Jameson observes that in a number of recent works, and especially goes through a number of different science fiction works, 
there is a new formal tendency in which it is not the representation of utopia, but rather the conflict of all possible utopia, and the arguments about the nature and desirability of utopia as such, which move to the center of attention. And this, to me, is incredibly important in um, addressing the, the sort of the reality of, a, of, of not only undergraduates who have seen every type of utopia, every type of, every type of uh, vision of a, of a perfect future of society, whether they be Marxist or capitalist, ecological, you know, when they're in a reality that seems to be so bereft of utopia that bringing about a number of different utopias, a plurality of utopias, becomes all the more powerful concept. And furthermore, if the core of Marxist utopia, and a number of different theorists have said this, um, people such as Shlomo Avenari, Bertel Ullman, who's at this conference, um, have stressed that in full communism, not that you, usually when people talk about Marxist understanding of utopia, they say there's two, under, two phases of communism. There is, con, there is phase one communism right after the revolution, where there will still be many of the uh, remnants of capitalism in, um, in existence, but in the second or fuller stage of communism, that work, that unalienated work, will be the core of this vision. That if we understand um, both Bloch and Derrida as theorists of utopian work, and when we place them together, that if, um, if we con uh, conceive as a full concept of utopian work, necessitating a positive blocking phase and a negative Derridian phase. And this, these two phases are reiterated in once again a dialectic, dialectical manner, um, oscillating between the particular and the universal, the ideal and the material, that these two concepts, um, when placed together, can have an even stronger affiliation with Marx's understanding of a utopian work where one might hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, and criticize at night, where one works <coughs> in, a, um, in, the, in relations of production that are not characterized by singular, reified um, divisions of labor. Here, let me read a, a brief quote um, from from Hudson, who, who, who brings up this possibility, and the, the latter part of my paper is when I go through and really try to parse out what, what, this, what this might mean, but, but let me read this. Bloch provides critical materials for a history and geography of desire and for an analysis of utopian figures and texts which indicate a referent not present in their discourse. He also develops a concept of traces which could be usefully challenged in light of a jury in semantics, with its emphasis upon difference and erasure. Bloch's work as a whole is subject to a Derridian critique. It also contains elements for a positive deconstruction of Western metaphysics against Derrida, based on the insight that the meaning which is never completely present has a positive rather than a negative connotation. And th thinking about them together, um, and thinking about them, especially when we go through, and I think I'll end on this, a concrete exercise. And at the end of my paper, what I do is I take a look at how both of these theorists approach the French Revolution, because both of them um, discuss it um, as, as one of the key um, elements for contemporary bourgeois utopian thought. You know, it's the foundation, really, for the rights of man, you know, in, the, in all of its imperfections, you know, obviously taking the terror into account, but, you know, the, de the Declaration of Rights of Man. And whereas, um, Bloch will take a look at what happened in um, 1789 and say, well, there's a, a kernel there. Even in, in the assertion of the rights of bourgeois man, there is what he will call um, a trace of not yet political power and socialized freedom. And Derrida will go on and say, well, still, even within any sort of utopian socialized freedom, there is always, there is a there is an excluded other. And if we think about this effort to think about the French Revolution, not in and of itself, but as a 
as, as, as the material upon which the cultivation of a, a utopian attitude could come about. That's where I see the real possibilities, the advantages, and uh, a, a, a uh, understanding of utopia that might not only be more convincing to Marxists who have traditionally eschewed the concept of utopia, but also to uh, my students who really see very little hope in the future at all. Thank you. Um, anybody has a question for Jason concerning his, uh, his talk? Yeah, well, just to kind of a question about utopia, really, because, I mean, at the beginning of your paper, or your talk, you, you said you know, about Marx and Engels' you know, critique of utopia. And it seems to me that, in one sense, well, you know, like Engels in Socialism, Utopia, and Scientific, kind of saluted the utopians and said these guys had great ideas, but they just didn't have any uh, sense of how they would be realized, what the concrete agents would, would be. And of course, for Marx and Engels, that was the working class, the proletariat. And I just wonder, I mean, if the same criticism might be leveled against Bloch, I, whom mm -hmm. I haven't read, and Derrida, whom I have, at least that specters of Marx, that um, I mean, they are both. I, I mean, the, you were saying they're both theorists of utopian work, um, but uh, I mean, certainly with Derrida's stuff about the ghosts and uh, the spectre and all that, I mean, which is very suggestive, really. Um, but I mean, what what exactly is what is the ghost? What is the the agent? I mean, what are the means by which mm -hmm. this utopia could be a, achieved? So I guess I'm, I'm saying. Is the, the classical critique of the classical Marxist critique of utopianism still could we sort of use that against utopianism in its new guises, the, the people that you're talking about? Do we need to think about the question of agency and how these uh, ideals could be realized? And is that where both theorists that you've been talking about kind of let us let us down in, in a way? Um. I, I, I think that's a great question. Um, now, even though you didn't uh, really ask about Bloch, I'm going to start by answering, by right, talking about him, because he, he really still believes that the working class would be the agent. And that um, in the process of creating utopias, um, this will really be a type of positive ideology for a party, and that it really comes into the question, the class unseek, the two class seek. The, the class, you know, in itself to a class for itself question, right? So, um, with Derrida, you're right, it's much more amorphous, it's much more out there. He does talk about this concept of a new international, and I do, I address it in my paper. And this new international, it seems, will be a social formation that is unified by a very loose understanding of exclusion that those who are excluded will come together and, and somehow form a coalition, somehow form a, a flexible party, perhaps. It really, when I read this, it brings to mind uh, the work of Lacan Mouffe in Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, who are also, I think, who are also influenced by a deconstructive critique. Now, there's still a host of problems with this. You know, it's, it's um, not only not um, clear, you know, exactly who would be part of this. But if we're thinking about what a Marxist utopia is, there's no centrality upon Marxist categories. You know, exploitation, alienation, all of the things that, that we would identify in terms of Marx. Now, Derrida goes on to say that, of course, those excluded, those um, who are under the yoke of capitalist oppression will be part of the new international. It will probably be one of the core concepts of this new international. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, critiques, especially by those uh, of people like Eagleton, really don't, um, don't give my concept enough credit. And this is once again where I think that, uh, that joining the two might be something that's, that's useful. I mean, Bloch is 
you know, not only was a member of, of the Communist Party, you know, through various breaks throughout his life, but but, but really thought that any, the core of any social progress will still be a traditional understanding of class. But when joined to when Bloch's understanding of the agent is joined to Derrida's understanding of this amorphous agent, I think we can get a, um, a sort of a fruitful dialogue of you know a class-based politics which does have which is more open to different types of uh, left social movements, uh, a, a feminism, ecology, you know. And really, sort of, we still have, I think if we put them together, we still have a core in working class politics, but we have the possibi more possibility for coalition and flexibility. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna go into a very long conversation about how for Marx, the possibility for a different future is actually imminently constituted in terms of value. You know, it's the value dimension of capital that creates Capital is the possibility of mm -hmm. the determinate negation of capital. Right. And this is not to say that capitalism is a theological, historical unfolding. Um, but it's just, um, I guess I'm trying to retweet the conversation from a subjectivist engagement with utopia, which I do fully believe in and we do need to theorize, but we can't theorize that without the objective. And in right. order to get to that conversation, I guess I'll engage the sort of pedagogical question that you um, started off with, which is about the um, students not being, like you said, two different things, which is students not being able to imagine a future, and then a different thing which I thought was future uh, students having no hope in the future. And so I think, like I just came from a disaster film panel, and I mean, we have, you know, disaster yeah. film is one of the most, you know, and uh, Jameson says in Archaeology of the Future, it's an apocalyptic film. I mean, we have a huge explosion of, I mean, these are the most popular uh, Hollywood films <laughs> in existence. So there is, and I think that this is also because of crisis. So, you know, and, uh, global right. warming and terrorism and all of these global um, signs of apocalypse are signs of uh, capitalism kind of breaking apart. Mm -hmm. The point is to, um, you know, teach for it rather than some sort of apathetic or um, pessimistic, or to look within the conditions of the present and appropriate those conditions, which I think is also not a uh, not the work of mourning as a sort of um, acting out, but as appropriating sort of trauma. So I guess I'm like creating trauma. Okay, actually, Interesting. actually not like the not performing trauma but working through the trauma, through its appropriation of history, so okay. not being conditioned within the psyche. I know this is a lot, but no, the, no, no. the prominent point right. is um, that it's seeking potentiality of change within the very structures of capitalism itself, which would condition a progressive future rather than going back to some sort of survivalist caveman post-apocalyptic state. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's basically it. No, um, I think th that's that's an excellent point. It's something that I struggle with mm -hmm. in, in, in writing about this, in the sense that, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I do kind of feel like, like proud of me, right? You know, I'm an idealist, you know, and, and, and when working on this, you know, I've talked about, you know, all of the, you know, this work, which is not real work in the sense of taking a hammer or building a movement, but it's a, a type of, you know, anti-ideological work, and, it, and, and always making sure to um, stress, and we, I, I have a brief bit about my, in this in my paper, that at least, especially in Bloch, he sees this as complementary. You know, the idea of looking, especially within the work of mediation, you know, taking one's ideas, little daydreams, and, look, and looking for um, congruences, possibilities for linking um, you know, what we think, what the not yet produces within the concrete possibilities of what you said, the unfolding uh, internal contradictions of capitalism. Now, the only thing that I would say, and this is not, th this is in no way contradicting what you're saying, but um, it, it seems to me that especially in, in disaster films, some of them are very, very, and in, in our current sort of dystopian funk, I guess is the only way to put it, 
that they're, they're very, very concrete and very, very sophisticated understandings of what could go wrong, yeah. especially in terms of the ecology. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only like students, but I think most of us, well, I hope most of us, but maybe that's optimistic, you know, understand that it, in, it also in, in a Marxist sense that, you know, constant growth cannot go on. Right. Growth for the sake of growth. So the valorization of capital for the sole aim of valorization is going to end up in some sort of trauma. And people get that. But how do we turn that, you know? And, in me, and it seems to me at least there's a promise or at least a call for having some sort of idealistic process to to bring about that turn, mm -hmm. and that and that's why and that's why I focused focus on this mm -hmm. um, because um, you know in, when we go through and when we talk to people, I expect not only you know in my own com students in my own community, but workers in my own community who have lost their jobs, mm -hmm. you know, who have you know been on the blunt end of what's happening to industry in America, they say, of course it's unfair. You know, and of course I know that, you know, I'm all, I was always only working for the boss and, you know, and the promises of, of, you know, we're all in this together don't work. They get that, but to move that forward, you know, and to, and, and to take the, the what, you're, what you're talking about, you know, the concrete sort of imminently unfolding contradictions and turn that into something that, that isn't just, well, I'm going to move, I'm going to go up north. And, but the and, point is, is know. that there'll be an, uh, necessarily an end game to capital. That's what I'm talking about, the objective. So it's not about how do we think. I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, there is always a simultaneous uh -huh. dialectic between the subjective and the objective. Right, right, right. But what will determine the potentiality for a reconciliation of freedom and necessity, let's right, say. Right, okay. Like, you're still thinking, um, like, your framework is still associated in the subject. How do we think about this? How, and I, that work is important, mm -hmm. but I'm, I guess I'm just trying to stress that there will be an unnecessarily an end game, and it's determined technically by the shrinking, um, the disaccumulation of. That. Okay, I, uh, I see what you're saying. So I see what you're you know saying. What I'm, saying? I'm, I'm locating it determinately. Okay. Potentiality for change. So, the, so the end game being, you know, when the contradictions pile up, and then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know okay. as um, a Dridian, we will hate this, but I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a Dridian. Okay, well, I'm so actually not a Dridian. So I mean, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The gentleman in the back, you have a question. Actually, my question was along very similar lines. I'm similarly perplexed with the, how difficult it is to talk to current students and even current environmental activists about utopian outlooks and the tremendous popularity of, as the other questioner was saying, the end of civilization discourse, neo-primitivism, and yeah. all of that. And I'm, I'd just be curious to hear more about what light the theorists we're discussing here might have to shed on potential ways to transform that discourse and take it to, to a different place. Well, I th may I suggest that we move to the next presenter? Uh, what did you say? I'll, I'll, I'll say something very, very brief. Is that okay? 30 minutes left. What? 30 minutes left. Yeah. Okay, you should go. I mean, yeah, you should go then. If we only have 30 minutes left, you should go. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, you should go then. All right. Um, I was kind of thinking about what exactly I should say in relation to Jason's really interesting presentation about the because, uh, well, uh, you know, finding linkages, connections, this is really the most interesting parts of doing this kind of work. And one question I do have for you, and this sort of relates back to my presentation, is the um, historical biographical context of uh, both Bloch and uh, Derrida. Why is it they're interested in this question of utopia uh, and work of mediation, work of mourning, as you say? And are there any ways to link these two ideas of works to the uh, collective labor that you were mentioning at the end, which I found very, very suggestive? But uh, I suppose one link is to talk about Terry Eagleton, which, whom you mentioned in relation to uh, the critique of Derrida's uh, Spectres of Marx. Because Terry Eagleton is also, well, he writes on different topics, but he's also written on Oscar Wilde. And some of the observation he makes about Oscar Wilde is uh, very, very, uh, very, very pertinent for my presentation. Uh, Wilde, as you may know, is uh, a character that 
it's hard to really pin down because his own way of talking, his rhetoric, his own uh, gestures and verbal plays are based on having many masks and not really having any sense of authenticity. So, and this comes out of different reasons. I mean, you can find this in the particular essay that I'm going to talk about, uh, Soul of Man Under Socialism, published in 1891. And, uh, and the reasons uh, Eagleton talks about is the fact that uh, Wilde was between two places all the time. Right? He was both Irish, he was, uh, and at the same time he was playing to an English upper class audience in the theaters. So he's using the language of the bourgeois theater in making fun of it, satirizing it, but within the conventions uh, at the same time. And he has his root. His mother, Speranza, was an Irish nationalist, and he had sympathy for it, but he was not really political. And the same thing with his relationship to socialism. Um, he was the reason, uh, some argue, uh, Morris, I mean, not Morris, but Oscar Wilde was interested or got interested in the topic of socialism was because of the influence that William Morris had on it. And I'd like to read a passage from uh, uh, E.P. Thompson's uh, very famous biography of uh, William Morris. And uh, this is a postscript to the revised edition that Thompson did in 1976. Uh, originally, the book was published uh, in 1955 with all the Stalinist pieties, as Thompson said, purged of all that. And this is what he has to say about Morris, which is, I think, applicable to, to some extent to Wilde himself. Uh, this is Thompson talking. When I say that Morris may be assimilated to Marxism only in the course of reordering of Marxism itself, I don't, of course, imply that Marxist thinkers have not noticed these problems or proposed solutions. But it is in this area that I think the problem still lies. And the case of quote, Morris and Marxism bewilderment before it emphasizes that the problem is unresolved. Moreover, it should now be clear that there is a sense in which Morris, as a utopian and moralist, can never be assimilated to Marxism not because of any contradiction of purposes, but because one may not assimilate desire to knowledge. And because the attempt to do so is to confuse two different operative principles of culture. So that a phrase a problem wrongly. And Marxism requires less a reordering of its parts and a sense of humility before those parts of culture which it can never order. The motions of desire may be legible in the text of necessity and may then become subject to rational explanation and criticism. But such criticism can scarcely touch these motions at their source. What Marxism on its own, we now know, has never made anyone, quote, good or bad, although a faith arising from other sources, but like a claim as Marxism has sustained epic courage in a bad faith, arising from other sources, but a claim as Marxism has defiled the first premises of Marx. So that what Marxism might do for a change is to sit on its own head a little in the interest of socialism's heart, capital S. It might close down one counter in its universal pharmacy and cease dispensing potions of analysis to cure the maladies of desire. This might do good politically as well, since it would allow a little space, not only for literary utopians, but also for the unprescribed initiatives of the everyday man and woman who, in some part of themselves, are also alienated and utopian by turns. Uh, now, I think this is relevant to the discussion in the wild because when you read this text, this very celebrated text in 1891, Oscar Wilde, uh, which according to other people has been inspired by his uh, visitation to the Fabian Society where George, Ber George Bernard Shaw gave a talk. And Shaw, after he read this essay, said, this is really witty and interesting, but it has nothing to do with socialism. Well, the reason that I think it is something to do with socialism in the Thompson sense is because the aspiration for utopian desires and utopian radical change is something that is very at the very basis of Marx's ideas. Even though there's this critique that the utopian socialists lacked uh, the relationship to the material condition, the objective conditions, that they were, as you said, building castle in the sky or castle in the air, that they had this blueprint. And the reason for his critique, Marx's critique, was not so much because they were wrong, but whether well, their aspirations were wrong, but because they wanted to impose these blueprints on changing and shifting geographies. Uh, changing in social conditions, historical conditions. And you have to work, rework the blueprint from within, from inside out, so to speak, from the actual material conditions. So, in relation to uh, why we may say of him that the problem is not so much that he is a utopian, that he's trying to impose a blueprint, because he doesn't have a blueprint, if you read this essay. 
he doesn't have any concrete an analysis of any situations, nor does he have a, a particular uh, program, let's say. What he says, what he speaks, when he speaks for socialism, he's speaking for socialism because it is for individualism, or capital I. What does that mean? Well, uh, in his eyes, private property, and we assume he's talking about Victorian capitalist private property, demeans human beings because it forces a lot of people, the poor, to work, starvation wages, cleaning streets, doing these alienated, very uh, inhuman work, work that is not ennobling of the soul. And for him, the work that is ennobling of the soul is art, first and foremost. So this is a reason why we should abolish private property, uh, for everybody to be able to work something that is artistic, to create something. And of course, we know this is really at the root of Marx's uh, work uh, in 1844. The economic and philosophic management, where uh, Marx is talking about, in sort of pseudo Hegelian terms, about the objectification of your, a part of your personality. That this is at the root of a species being, right? When he talks about four types of alienation, he's talking about the alienation from the labor process, the worker who doesn't have a control of his labor process, the alienation from the commodity because he, he or she doesn't own it. He, has, he or she has to get the wage to buy that particular product that he or she she's making, alienation from the fellow workers because you're controlled under the supervision of the boss. So you can't really fraternize and, and free association. And finally, the alienation from species being, which is the, uh, the human nature's predisposition to create something freely under conditions of free association. So this is something that Morris definitely shaped. And I think we should remember the fact that there is a kind of chronological gap between Marx's 1844 uh, text, celebrated initially, as we know in relation to this revival of Marxist humanism in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and then the publication of Marxist Capital, which is 1867 so When he does uh, go through, after the blue books, his time in uh, the British Museum, to have a really concrete material analysis of what capitalism is about. And implicit therein, of course, is the utopian aspiration <coughs> that I've seen in part eight to volume one of Capital, where he's talking about the expropriators being ex expropriated. But he does not want to spell this out because he's writing in time of defeat, Marx is. And for him, the way to react to that moment of defeat is by analyzing what the machinery of capital is, using empirical analysis and trying to uh, utilize, as you were mentioning, a scientific, let's say, analysis of capitalism as opposed to the more utopian, future-oriented uh, prospect, which can only come from material social relations anyway. But again, I think we, when we look at Wilde, we have to do the same thing for him in relation to his own context. He is not a man of the working class, obviously. He is a man who has never had a, so when you read this text, uh, So a Man Under Socialism, we are struck, obviously, by some prophetic insights for its time. For example, the fact that uh, uh, he believes that uh, all the drudgeries in the world should be all abolished and be replaced by machinery. And uh, this sort of uh, vision that he has. And also the idea that um, uh, Jesus, first and foremost, is a man who embodies this free spirit of creation. That Jesus was not here to uh, give people pain or to make people suffer, et cetera, et cetera, but to, to have people be themselves, right? And this idea of being yourself, first and foremost, that he said, uh, while such should be on the porters of the future, as opposed to be thyself, which was on the porters of antiquity, is very much prescient, as we know, bourgeois self-help uh, ideologies, which have been kind of appropriated by them. And, uh, but at the time, if you think about it, Victorian capitalism, there is no consumerism as we understand it, right? But he's linking this idea of being yourself, realizing something of yourself in relation to uh, a socialist future. So all the promises of socialism, at least uh, Wilde was mentioning, has been partly appropriated or, or, or co-opted by consumer capitalism in the 21st century, 20th and 21st century. Now, uh, what, is, what is useful then about Wilde's uh, view of uh, socialism today uh, and utopianism? I, I think one of the most important things we actually take from his uh, idea is that uh, This relationship between art and work, 
because I'm very much, very much uh, intrigued by how you can connect this idea of uh, work of mourning, work of mediation, abstract theorizing, if you will, or creative imagination, work, these works to something that is concretely within the sphere of uh, the labor process. Uh, where both Jason and I live in the Midwest, there was a huge strike back in the 70s in Lordstown. And uh, one of the things that the workers did uh, up until then was to double up, meaning that uh, uh, a couple of workers worked together, so the worker, one worker would do the, the work of two workers, and then the, during, the, during the time of one worker would take a break and listen to music, read a book, think, imagine, or even if they're doing some kind of labor process, they will uh, imagine some other stuff. And this particular act of creativity obviously belongs to this imaginative sphere, but it's never, it's often not articulated in books. Right? Sometimes it takes the form of strikes and we see these posters rising up in Paris, uh, May 68, for example, where the walls of streets of Paris were uh, vandalized with uh, that particular phrase, pa all part of the imagination, as opposed to all part of the party or all part to the state. Um, and I think this is what more, uh, Thompson is trying to remind us. He's a man of, of course, 1956, right, who's breaking for Stalinism and trying to revive that spirit speaking of spirits, of, uh, of Marxist uh, humanism, Marxist utopia, which is grounded, I believe, in, in collective uh, aspirations. Now, I can't speak fully for a while, because in his case, it is mediated through his relationship to his mother, or maybe his own observations at a distance uh, of the, uh, for example, his relationship to the rent boys, with whom he had uh, homosexual relationships. Because this was also another part of his double lifestyle. Right? I mean, a few years after 1891, he's found out in 1895 for his uh, uh, gay activities, and he's basically uh, thrown into jail and becomes the man that he's sort of writing about in this particular essay, where he says, a man can be thrown in jail, but his soul can be free. And he does find himself in jail, although his, his soul is not liberated therefrom. And he dies soon after he, uh, uh, he got, gets out of prison. Um, I would say, in a long history of uh, social, intellectual, artistic, cultural theory, which to which Bloch and Derrida belong to, uh, there's another point that is uh, we are, it's necessary for us to make in relation to Wilde's idea of uh, utopianism, and that is, 19th century is a period in which we have uh, the rise of the so-called free market in its full glory. Of course, capitalism has been developing at least since 1492. Of course, if you talk to war system theory and all the debates are in, and they have this debate whether 500 years or 5,000 years. But let's just say from the 18th and 19th century, there's a radical shift in the maturation of industrial capitalism as, the, as represented by England. In this period of 19th century, uh, patronage system that artists and cultural producers have enjoyed up until then are thrown into the free market. Uh, we're talking about people like Baudelaire, we're talking about people like Mallarmé, the symbolist poet, we're talking about people like Flaubert, who, in the, faces of their, in the face of their particular professions, being thrown onto the market, had to defend some kind of autonomy for themselves. And often it is expressed in full contempt of the masses, that the workers look at the beast of burden. They have no imagination. This is a note that, of course, Wilde himself strikes in this essay. These people have no imagination whatsoever. The rich are the most cultivated, civilized, and cultured people. And that's why we have to abolish private property. But the fact of the matter, was, the matter is, is, this is not entirely true, as we know from the works of Thompson, who uh, investigated the, uh, the labor of people who are at the very bottom and who are losing their customary rights in the feudal period, but at the same time activating their imagination to build a new culture, uh, imperfect, uh, obviously limited by their circumstances, but still a culture that has a relationship to the tradition of, let's say, the English Revolution, the freeborn Englishman, and so on. And so, I think when we read Wilde, we have to both see the positive aspect or dimension, or his link to the tradition of the Enlightenment, right, of this focus on, or this presupposition that human beings are born free, as Rousseau said, and they are, they're supposed to live under conditions of freedom to create something freely. And that this is a root of wild, but at the same time, he does share this elitism, if you will, or blindness to the agency of the working class, which is something that not only him, but the asceticists of that period, people like Baudelaire and Flaubert, have shared. 
but understandably historically, because again, they're reacting as people, individuals, artists, and writers to a particular historical conditions where their prerogatives in the paternalistic system of uh, pre-capitalist or uh, feudal era royal system are being negated. Um, so the debate in a way continues. I think it's very difficult at this point in history to try to really find a way to, to, to reconcile these issues. Uh, when I was in the University of Texas at Austin, I was taught by a Professor Neil Neri by Peter Berger, a German theorist, that um, uh, modernism, which of course, while is prefiguring this uh, transitional phase from Victorian England to uh, post-Victorian, more fully uh, industrialized modernist era of capitalism, that uh, this modernism that comes out of this is basically elitist in orientation. That this must be rejected uh, in view for some kind of political type of art. Not in terms of socialist realism, but something in the order of Brecht to, to and I think he was, he was particularly interested in engaging the ideas of uh, Walter Benjamin, which comes back to your own uh, theorist, Bloch, who was a colleague of Benjamin, who has, had a messianic notion of a revolution, but also a very materially grounded notion of cultural production, right, and he's an uh, authorist uh, producer. Uh, he talks about at the end, about the dangers of aestheticizing politics, which he thought the fascists were doing. And the importance was to politicize art, not in the socialist realist sense, reductive sense, but somehow to engage uh, the artists as actually a part of the working class. This was sort of an embryonic idea that he was uh, creating. It didn't really work out. But uh, I think this controversy is still not really resolved because uh, in the discussions since then, uh, since Wilde's in the 1880s and now 1930s and 40s and so on and so forth, today in the postmodern or whatever <laughs> present we live in, the question of art and its role in consumer capitalism has now become very, very uh, clear. Like what can artists do in relation to the working class? In fact, the term working class itself has become deracinated because of all the ideological uh, propaganda of the last 30, 40 years. Uh, most people, as you know very, very well, workers that I come across, or one of my friends in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, a UE organizer, a very much an honorable union, left-wing union from the 50s and 60s, often remind me that uh, the working class in the United States think of themselves as middle class, right? So how, how could cultural producers or academic workers can engage these questions of, uh, of utopia and imagination to the work of labor that's actually going on and losing? I don't think this question can be easily answered. In fact, I don't think any theorist or artist or writers can answer it uh, uh, without being uh, arrogant about uh, what they think they know. So. Uh, my, uh, so my sort of provisional conclusion to this is that uh, when we read Wilde uh, and we read the way in which he's attacking authoritarian socialism, he's very explicit about this. He's against the authority of the state. And so Wilde himself says he's sort of more of an anarchist than later on. Uh, he does prefigure sort of the criticism that the anarchist Bakunin and so on uh, brought against state capitalism or state socialism or however you want to describe the regime of the Soviet Union since 1917 and all the sort of satellite or, or uh, closely related types of uh, Marxisms and, and socialisms. But at the same time, we often wonder exactly this question of agency. How can we link up? And I think this problem of agency is not an easy one. Uh, one proposition I do have about uh, utopia is that perhaps the utopian imagination emerges more often than not in moments of transition. Uh, we see that obviously in Wilde's case before, between Victorian capitalism and uh, the emergence of something new, uh, the Russian Revolution, and the emergence of state capitalism and so on. And, um, and so his own thinking about these matters have to take a utopian turn necessarily perhaps. As Marx and Engels were talking about the early utopian socialists, they, they're Part of their sympathy lay in the fact that these people represented the transition period between the, uh, the feudal period as it was ending in the emergence of capitalism. And that's why their ideas had to be utopian, because they didn't have a working class to deal with. But now that we're facing uh, deindustrialization, 
and uh, deracination and of course financial crisis and so on the last 40 years. Um, perhaps this is a time also when utopian imagination is necessary precisely to preserve some of the resources and energies. Not so much to do the work of the self-activity that the working class must do for themselves. But uh, I think Thompson, I like to end with a note of Thompson because when you read uh, E.P. Thompson's English Making Things Working Class, you get a very distinct sense that part of the power of the English working class in the 1790s as they were forming themselves into the only part of the 19th century was not so much that they fomented a revolution, which they didn't, but they, they, they created a new distinct culture on their own. And part of this culture was reading of books. Uh, Tom Paine, Common Sense, uh, Volney's uh, history, of, uh, history of the Civilizations. And a lot of these texts and little pamphlets circulated around and became part of this artisanal working class culture. And uh, I believe that the, these utopian novels of today, let's say Ursula Le Guin or you know, Stevenson, perhaps could function the same way. When I talk to my students who are mostly from working class roots or they work part time jobs and workers themselves, you know, they have interest in things like Dungeons and Dragons and WoW, or the Warcraft, and all these other seemingly apolitical things. But actually, I, I don't know if they're apolitical entirely. Because I was talking to this particular uh, student of, at the BGSU, Bowling Green State University, where I work part time. And he was telling me that uh, a lot of people feel closer to people with whom they play games online. And of course, we quick, we're quick to judge as Marxist or radical cr critics of the mass media that this is a simple case of alienation. But actually, these people that they do, uh, what is it, uh, hunts with on the online gaming, they feel so close that they actually move to their neighborhood and they will put them up. They actually can go to these people and just sleep and go from place to place. Something I can't even ask uh, most friends or even the relatives to do. So there seems to be a kind of creation of new alternative communities. I'm not saying this is easily translated into politics, but there is some kind of energy always moving at the subterranean level. And uh, I think we, as, as thinkers, as readers, and as students of the working class, we have to find a way to incorporate them, right? Just as we don't want to deny that there is some kind of creative act going on as a worker resists or refuses work, you know, just by even by a little bit, right? That moment of resistance does exist, and we have to take that into account, even that if that does not lead necessarily to a strike, work stoppage, wildcat strike, uh, to say nothing of a revolution. So. I think this constant rethinking, reprocessing, is something that uh, Jason was talking about in relation to uh, Derrida. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you be realistic, demand the impossible. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great sort of yeah. Fits in with the topic of today's session, I guess. Um, well, I, I mean, my, uh, just a kind of thought provoked by what you were saying. Um, I mean, you, you both seem to be insisting on the necessity of utopian imaginings, but isn't the problem that uh, doesn't the capitalist system, doesn't that pr present its own utopias uh, and kind of I don't know, capitalism is very good at, through the media, as presenting a sort mm -hmm. of I mean, utopia, which would not be a sort of socialist one, utopia where, I don't know, we're all kind of affluent consumers driving around in our magnificent new cars and uh, mm -hmm. having a choice of 800 uh, varieties of whatever it, it, it might be. So I, I guess, is there something distinctive about, or maybe it's a stupid question, actually, it's distinctive about a, a socialist kind of utopia, because as I say, the, the existing system seems quite adept at uh, I don't know, capturing our dreams of a better future, but steering those into yeah. I don't know, the, the idea of a uh, totally consumerized, commodity-driven kind of future where we're all happy consumers. So mm -hmm. I just the, the problem is how to capture the utopian energies in a different direction, I guess. That's a rather incoherent question, actually. No, I think, I think this, uh, this made me think about Jason's line in the paper about uh, 
Bourgeois, how he was talking about the very fact that uh, the idea of bourgeois rights as constituted by the French Revolution, for example, seems to us to be uh, very limited, restricted, because it only talks about the citizen, it excludes so many different people. And it's all true, but at the same time, he is very much uh, uh, emphasizing the fact that that particular notion of bourgeois rights has a sort of negation, a negation of negation, in the sense that that particular notion is appropriated by different movements later on. And we can see that in the civil rights movement, where obviously people are uh, speaking up for the right of, well, the right of voting, the franchise. And that seems to be just calling for the right of uh, bourgeois representation. But actually, through that kind of struggle, uh, there is new spaces and new conversations that open up. And I think it's important to remember that, uh, uh, and here I'm kind of ambivalent about this myself, but in the Communist Manifesto, 1848, you know, Marx, uh, at that moment, he's speaking really about the revolution in nature, almost in this sort of apocalyptic phraseology about uh, capitalism, how bourgeoisie are going to, the most revolutionary class of history, is going to break down Chinese walls, turn, on, turn the sacred into profane. And there's all messianic language that comes straight from the Bible, virtually. So there is something dynamic and powerful, destructive and, and utopian, uh, unquestionably about capitalism. And that's why I think part of the enduring appeal or uh, of structural capitalism lies in this. So I think the Marxist gambit for, for many, including Marx himself in some moments, how to utilize that dynamism in, Mar in, in capitalism to the advantage of the most deracinated and oppressed. Uh, this is, of course, based uh, not on science, but on faith, because there is no guarantee uh, that uh, the working class are going to liberate themselves necessarily. Um, but I think at the end of the line, when you're talking about political commitments, that's really something you can't really prove by way of uh, uh, empirical evidence. Now, I do, I do want to say about uh, agency in relation to, to Morris, I mean not Morris, but the wild, because um, you were talking about consumerism and so on and so forth. Well. Wild, uh, one of the, his defects is that he cannot see the agency of, for example, the slaves. I mean, he makes this almost Wildian paradoxes where he says, well, uh, it's like uh, the, the public often criticizes the agitator, because the agitator comes to the masses and they rile them up and uh, tr try to break the peace and try to make them sink and do things that they never thought before. And he says, that's why we need agitators. For example, in the struggle for abolition, slaves were not interested in they had nothing to do with the abolition of slavery. It was the agitators, the abolitionists who, were, uh, who came in and made the abolition possible. And when the slaves were liberated, they didn't even feel good about the fact that they were uh, free because they couldn't even now make ends meet, unlike under chattel slavery. Well, this is patently untrue. The struggle of many slave, slave revolts uh, did play a part in agency, as we know from the history that's been done and by many, many historians since then have revealed that uh, but, uh, the agency of the slaves and people close to them are very much part of the, the making of a, of a new society that was prefigured almost in a sense by what happened in Reconstruction, imperfectly. But nonetheless, it was there for a moment. So in terms of consumerism, I think we can also see uh, a kind of agency at work there too. Uh, I mean, this is often exploited or particularly emphasized by people like Ralph Nader emphasizes consumer sovereignty. And we know the limitations of that, but at the same time, it does speak to how do we really theorize or think about uh, consumer, consumerism in relation to new forms of social agency. Just to give you a brief example about this, uh, Yoshimura Takaaki, the Japanese radical thinker uh, in the 1980s, talks about how by the 1980s, half of, more than half of Japanese uh, average income has been unloaded to consumption that is not necessary. Goods that are not for subsistence, and that means consumers have this uh, right of recall, essentially in relation to the state. That if they stop consuming all these things, they could always abolish the state or abolish the system under which they live. The problem is, it's very difficult, almost impossible, quite often, to organize consumers in a concerted fashion. Um, so I think this question of consumption, production, who's the working class. Again, I want some of the questions that uh, uh, we are faced with and we can't answer really with, uh, definitive uh, quality. Yeah. Um, I just have a few short um, comments about the presentation here. Um, first, 
to um, the, the notion of utopia, um, utopia. Um, in a book that I recently read, um, it's interpreted as simultaneously nowhere and now here, uh, with the play of the words of obviously, nowhere and now here. Um, I think to some extent we probably should deconstruct or demystify the notion of utopia. Um, and um, for me, from a Marxian political economic um, perspective, it's pro it can probably uh, or provisionally be defined as some just desire for something other than the ac than actuality, um, just very provisional. Um, and to that extent, I think you, um, utopian and also the social policy in related to um, you know the surplus en living energy or surplus um, labor power um, is exactly about how to distribute or how to organize the appropriation and distribution of these surplus living labor power. Um, and in connection with that, I have a sort of uh, example from a Chinese book film uh, about um, 20 years ago by director Xie Jin. Um, the movie's t name is Hibiscus Town. That movie um, was later received as a critique of the um, Cultural Revolution. Um, and there was one scene in, in that movie where the, the male protagonist, he, he was, um, because he refused to uh, engage in some private, uh, like a homosexual relationship with the female leader, he was um, given you know, the job of cleaning up the, uh, the, the sweeping the, the, the road, basically, um, but whereas he was an intelli intellectual. So that, that was, in that movie, conceptualized or presented as a sort of um, total disregard of the man's intellectual power by punishing him um, to do some manual job. Um, and in that, in a particular moment, when he was sweeping the road, he, he just burst into dance, dancing. So he used the, the broom. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. <laughs> he started to dance while sweeping the road, and that move, that image, just has been s stuck in my mind for the ever since I first saw it almost twenty years ago. I, I think that could be an example of the fusion of art and work, mm -hmm. uh, and also that's a telling example for me to how you know the hu surplus um, human living energy can be appropriated into both work and art. They, they are not. Um, I, I think that's a, a false dichotomy to some, to some extent. Um, and thirdly, uh, just in response to uh, Jason's um, uh, comment about, or, or the plan to perhaps present a plurality of utopia to students, I think there is both potential and, and risks. Um, especially in the sense that you want to present both capitalist utopia and socialist utopia. Um, so first, I think con conceptually, I don't know to what extent we can say there is a sort of capitalist utopia, or, or a kind of utopia that's so deeply entrenched in the capitalist mode of production. Um, uh, perhaps there, there is. Um, um, and then what would be a socialist utopia? Well, I think it, it can be productive. I mean, um, the, perhaps the, the just a juxtaposition of these two names, I think, can be productive. But I also think that there is a certain risk in, in terms of further uh, reifying may, maybe certain desire making it as in, uh, as if um, undetachable from certain mode of production. So that, that's just
Yeah, you know, I was thinking about how when you were talking about the movie, doc, there was a documentary I saw several years ago about the Brazilian uh, uh, sugarcane cutters. And it describes exactly what you're saying. These people are cutting canes, very, very arduous work. They were singing as they did. There was a rhythmic kind of dancing to it. And of course, we know from history of uh, the slave song in the United States, uh, slave songs uh, were produced, hymns and so on, in relation to the work we were. So even under the most oppressive conditions of chattel slavery. People do have this sort of utopian aspiration that they express. And that becomes the basis of what we consider culture. I mean, American root music is inconceivable without those slave songs, which uh, later fell into jazz and so on and so forth. I think you're very right about that. I guess, I don't know if people want to say, I have something brief to say. <laughs> um, but just, I, I, thanks for your comments today. I agree with you. There's a risk in terms of, you know, for thinking about plurality of utopias and presenting them, you know, presenting capitalism utopia and socialist utopia without ha having a very grounded in political economy and, and, and in our own historical situation, that type of utopia. But I wish he hadn't left because I was going to say something about, you know, is it the problem that we have this very robust capitalist utopia where we can buy 27 things? But just to be very blunt, that doesn't work. Trying to fulfill oneself through, I mean, not to say that there's not creative ways to do that. I think it's, what you were saying shows the inadequacy of a purely consumerist understanding of what utopia is. The people who try to really express themselves through buying and only buying, it, it ends up in, in alienation and dissatisfaction. If we read Naomi Klein, in no, no Logo, which I think is a great book. She talks about how when she was a kid, you know, she just wanted to buy, you know, go to the guest store, and, and how that was going to really allow her to express her individuality. And then she shows how not only through her own experience, but through sort of teens all over the world, that doesn't hack it. And they start, you know, people realize they can express themselves through brands. Yeah. You know, so they try to undermine it, they try to get creative with, with brands. So what's really interesting is that I find that most of my students really have never had any experience with trying to think of a, a real sort of deep conception of thinking of their labor themselves as art. Sure, they paint pretty, pretty pictures in art class, but that's not, yeah. you know, really trying to, you know, you know, express yourself and think about how you fit into your larger environment and how the environment affects yourself and how you have to affect the, affect the environment to in fact affect yourself. And really, you know, in thinking about the human beings as species beings, people really don't have any experience of that. They don't get it through work. They help. They don't get it at all in their high school experience. And maybe through, you know, through what we're both talking about, I think this is a commonality, um, the, of, of, of really working to have a, a thorough understanding of what uh, utopia for the self and utopia for the world and how that might be intertwined and how that might be necessitated upon certain social structures and upon certain paths of history. Um, that would be um, that would be something that would be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. So that's all I have to say. You know, I was just thinking, just kind of briefly myself. Uh, I, yeah, I wanted to comment on that what that guy was saying about uh, the similar uh, utopia. And the fact is, uh, I'm just thinking. He mentioned how that situation is slowly right next to be realistic, demand possible, part of the imagination. This is May '68. Well, the situation is in France with the only people uh, that I know at that time when there was a Watts rebellion and these, these uh, people in the hood just went to the streets and took all these like TV, et cetera, et cetera, and just had a riot. That, that they celebrated this as a kind of a consumer utopia backfiring, imploding on itself. Because, yeah, you're supposed to get all these goods, but you're supposed to go and work laboriously and actively and productively to get them. But they completely said, fuck it, we're going to just go directly to the place and get them. And I think that when you cut through that kind of capitalist mediation and, and actually take the consumer, promise of consumer uh, paradise you took it seriously and just act upon it, you do have riots and rebellions. And I mean, this is even before the uh, capitalist period when we talk about, for example, the uh, 19th century Japan, the transition point between feudalism and capitalism, when the black ships, Perry 
arrived on shore. A lot of the peasants had these uh, riots where they would go to the merchants' houses and just take what they needed, sake or rice, and they would dance at the same time because this was part of their religious uh, customs to go to the shrine. And of course, when something apocalyptic or disaster like happened, uh, like the arrival of black ship after was it, 300 years of isolation, then they sort of uh, access their own religious traditions and imagination. And that breaks out into pilgrimages and, and so on and so forth, which is not exactly the same as a re you know, revolution, but it is an act of rebellion against uh, these emerging systems of oppression. And I think that those things have to be acknowledged and legitimated, uh, regardless of where they are. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for listening. I'll clap for us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know. <laughs>